Okay, we will start. It's four o'clock and four minutes. Hello, everyone. Hello, Sally. Thank you for being with us today. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Kaya Shirok. I'm the director of ICOM Slovenia, board member of ICMEMO and of ETCOM, the Com ICOM Committee for Ethics. Um, we are in the year 2020 and the world changed dramatically. We are living in strange times and many museums have closed around the globe. We in Slovenia are closed right now. And of course, we can just think what's going to happen in the next year or in the next decades and how many of our colleagues will still have a job to return to, how many museums will reopen in the next months. But within all these questions, which of course, because of the COVID-19 have dramatical consequences, we still have to think about museums as trustworthy institutions. Museums are one of the most trusted institutions in the world. And our war, war voice, our voice matters. And this is what comes with tremendous responsibility and which requires the highest standards of professional practice. And at the same time, a very important statement, museums are not neutral. They are not, and they never will be. And as Wajak Soy, the ex-president of ICOM said last year at the CIMAM meeting, we have to discuss the meaning of museums and people working in the museums. We are not separate from our social and historical content. And what seems that it's separating, this is not neutrality. It's a choice. We are choosing not to address climate change, and this is not neutrality. Choosing not to talk about colonization, it's also not neutrality. And choosing not to advocate for equality in museums today, it's not neutrality. Choosing to remain silent when politics is taking control over museum policies all around the globe, it's not neutrality. And these are choices. And we as a society, especially a society working within the museum environments, we can make the better ones. And whatever we are choosing and whatever we stand for, we also have to rely on our Bible. And our Bible, the museum Bible, is the code of ethics. The code of ethics is a tool and we can use it for a self-regulation. We can use it when we have to answer very important questions about us, our work and our working environment. And even if we know that the legislations are changing from country to country, and in some countries that it's really very difficult to work within the museum environment, we have our code. And the code of ethics set, sets the minimum standards for museums, especially these standards are not just within the museum work itself, it's also about the museum staff. It's about how the museum staff should work, how they have to conduct what is harmful and what is good for museums and what is good for our profession. Museum staff must comply with the provisions of the ICOM code and be familiar with the code of ethics and policies related to the museum work. And we know that there are so many questions and that our work is changing and it's changed so rapidly in the last year. And our society is demanding more and more. And at the same time, even sometimes we are asking ourselves, what is the goal of our work? How it should be done? How can we make the society better? Today, we are going to try to answer to some of these questions with um, Professor Sally Yarkovich, and I am really very glad that she uh, accepted to be our, the guest of our webinar today. Uh, I will very short, shortly present you, Sally. So Professor Sally Yarkovich is an international known speaker, museum leader, and the author of the book, The Practical Guide to Museum Ethics. Sally is the director of the Educational Exchange and Special Projects at the American Scandinavian Foundation. And she also teaches museum anthropology 
at the Columbia University. Sally is the chair of the Ethic Committees, Committee, and she is in charge of the very highly profiled group of people which are working on the code of ethics and the content of the code. Her work, which draws upon her experience in museums and nonprofit cultural organizations, is increasingly engaged with how museums will face the ethical challenges of the future. Um, we have half an hour, Sally, and um, I can just start with the question, how do you came across with the code of ethics and what is for you the code of ethics? Thank you. Um, thank you. So I'm really pleased to be able to be here today. And thank you for that um, wonderful introduction, Kaya. I think you've, you've taken many of the words out of my mouth in terms of talking about the importance of the code. Um, I think the, the code of ethics is really a fundamental part of ICOM. And I think it's interesting to look back to see how that happened, um, to understand that why it plays such a large role in our lives in museums today throughout the globe. Um, part of the reason for that, I think, is, um, is that the public has very high expectations of us. Visitors attribute standards of honesty and authenticity to the objects that they see in our collections, and they value the, the um, knowledge grounded in sound research that's demonstrated in our exhibitions. They trust us both as purveyors of accurate information and as stewards of the collections that we hold on their behalf. It's then incumbent upon us as museum professionals to work to maintain that trust. One of the primary ways that we can do that is by calling attention to inviting, and abiding by the values, principles, and standards that are expressed in the ICOM Code of Ethics. And in fact, it was in part to build trust among the public that ICOM was first established. Um, ICOM was founded in 1946, just after World War II, which was very much in the spirit of the times that wanted to encourage cooperation in a world that had seen militant nationalism, wars, and destruction on a previously unimaginable scale. Its purpose was to create an international network of museum colleagues who would promote high standards of principled conduct in museums. Its founders envisioned ICOM as a platform to provide professionalism public service and cooperation among museums worldwide. Museums at the time acknowledged their interconnectedness and they also wanted to revalidate the standards related to the care of cultural heritage for among other reasons so that they could gain the trust of the public. So I think it's interesting that, it, that ICOM started with the idea that they wanted to um, probably regain the trust of the public and their institutions. And now we find ourselves in a position where the public does trust us, but we have to continually work to maintain that trust. So ICOM started as a small group of museum leaders, but as we know, it eventually grew into the largest international cultural organization and um, now has over 55,000 members. It continues to provoke standards as a fundamental part of its work. And the code of ethics is in fact um, part of that or a major part of that. Um, it has its roots in the 1970s, um, just after the UNESCO 1970 convention was passed when ICOM then um, adopted two resolutions, one that addressed the acquisition um, addressed acquisitions generally, and also the illicit transfer of cultural property. And another um, called for the proper documentation of collections that um, result from field research. So those two resolutions that were passed in the 70s, early 70s, were the beginning of the, of the, of the ICOM Code of Ethics, which really emerged full blown in the mid 80s. The code that we have today is um, a variation of the 1986 code, 
It's been updated and revised. Um, it, it was last adopted in 2004. So um, it was updated in 2001, and then it went through a process of, of um, sort of figuring out the priorities, what the priorities should be, and was, was reorganized to reflect those priorities in 2004. And it's interesting that um, one of the people who worked on it in 2004 talked about the fact that um, the code was, was revised because of the many social and economic changes that were affecting museums at the time, as well as their widening purpose. And he listed a number of things which um, sound very relevant today, actually. New cultural concepts and more diverse value systems, shaping museum programs and the use of their collections, changing income sources and operational contexts, museums growing reliance on com commercial activities and the increasing role of voluntary support organizations and membership bodies. And in some cases, independent foundations dedicated to museum fundraising. So in some ways, it's safe to say that those same trends, perhaps expressed in different ways, still influence and change museums today. Um, I just I wanted to talk briefly about Ethcom and how um, the Ethics Committee came into the picture because it came it was established shortly after the first Code of Ethics was passed in 1986, and it was called then the uh, well the code was called the ICOM Code of Professional Ethics, and a standing committee on museum ethics was established to monitor the progress of the code. It was, um, the committee was initially established to serve the secretariat and the executive board, but over, the, over time, the committee's role has expanded to provide expertise to the entire museum communities, community on all matters related to professional ethics. So right now, the, um, the committee has a mandate that includes monitoring the application of the code for museums, recommending changes, advising the leadership and the membership on ethical issues, con conducting, um, as it's called, concerted reflections on issues of particular importance, and creating tools to serve the museum community. A lot of what we do is um, very much behind the scenes. But um, you see it in statements that ICOM releases. For example, the um, ICOM statement on the independence of museums was developed by the Ethics Committee several years ago. And in addition, we've drafted guidelines um, that elaborate upon the code of ethics. Interestingly enough, the idea of revising the code of ethics came up about five years, five or six years ago. And at the time, while it was clear that the world was changing, the ethics committee didn't feel that things had changed enough to call for a revision of the code. They decided instead to um, respond to requests from the museum community and elaborate upon the code rather than changing the code. So they felt at that time more detail was needed in certain areas like deaccessioning and accessioning and fund development or fundraising. So at that time, um, the committee started developing what are now sets of guidelines um, that we can use to think about um, some of the issues that are really significant to us. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, our first guidelines just because um, they were our first attempt to create some help for the field. And those were on deaccessioning. They um, were an attempt to sort of clarify and demystify practices surrounding deaccessioning. For not, while not all countries um, permit deaccessioning, those that do, um, for those that do, it's, va it's a valid practice um, as long as it's done in the right way. And that's not something that is widely known. So deaccessioning seems to be a magnet for media attention. And it's, it's something that is um, always controversial, even sometimes when it's done in the right way. But basically it's for museums 
in countries that can deaccession, it's a practical um, matter for them for it allows them to identify objects in their collection that are duplicates are in poor condition or quality or are inconsistent with their mission and to remove the items from their collection so that they can free up their space and resources to care for the rest of the collection that they have or to strengthen the collection that they have. But the problems that arise in deaccessioning are problems that arise when the value of the objects becomes a part of the decision making process. And when the money that's realized from the sale of deaccessioned objects is used for supporting the general operations of the museum rather than for the collections themselves. So that's why things become um, controversial with deaccessioning. The Code of Ethics specifically says that collections, we hold the collections in public trust and they may not be treated as a realizable asset. That money realized from, received from the deaccessioning and disposal of objects from a museum's collection should be used solely for the benefit of the collections themselves and usually for acquisitions of the collections. So um, the reason for that is that when museums acquire objects of aesthetic, cultural, or scientific value, they hold the, the objects for the benefit of the public. Again, for, for the public and for future generations. And this all ties in again to the trust that the public places in us to take care of those collections. Although the things that we acquire may have significant monetary value, um, that really becomes secondary to their value as a means for enhancing the, our understanding of the world and our lives within the world. So it, the, the value in a sense of the collections changes when they become um, a part of our collections. In other words, that we, um, they are, are no longer considered financial assets, but they are considered our cultural assets and shouldn't be reflected on the balance sheet but instead studied and appreciated by scholars and the public and um, used to enhance our understanding of the world. So the, the ethical issue really comes up when a museum decides to deaccession from its collection and sells the objects and then has to make a decision about how to use the funds from the sale of the object. Ethically, the funds should be reinvested in a sense in the collection by purchasing other objects or by preserving and caring for the remaining collections. Any other use of funds from deaccessioning not only diminishes the collections, but it also betrays the trust that the public places in museums. So our ICOM's deaccessioning guidelines um, elaborate on these principles. They talk about when it's appropriate to consider a deaccessioning the proper legal and provenance research that needs to go into the process um, and to determine whether a museum can legally deaccession the selected pieces, and then the steps necessary to determine the appropriate disposition of the object. The guidelines also highlight the need for transparency when, um, when a museum is deaccessioning so that the public will understand and support the action of the museum. One of my favorite stories about deaccessioning isn't quite about deaccessioning and it it's, relates to a zoo rather than to a museum, but um, the Detroit Zoo a number of years ago had several elephants who were getting old and Detroit is in a very cold climate. So the elephants needed to be um, retired to a warmer climate. They were going to go to California to a, um, a farm that keeps um, zoo animals and takes care of them once they can no longer be on display. But these, these two elephants, Winky and Wanda, were their names, um, were very popular among the Detroit public. And so um, as the zoo began to talk about what they were going to, how they were going to retire the two elephants, the word leaked out to the press. And fortunately, the, the museum got in front of the media storm in a sense and had meetings with the public in the areas around Detroit to explain to them that 
um, why they were considering retiring the elephants and what they were going to do. And in fact, what happened as a result of this is that the public supported the museum and or the zoo and supported them in their efforts to retire the two elephants. So um, it's a, it, to me, that's an example of how if we trust the public in understanding, in, in giving them an understanding of how we work, they will in turn trust us and help support us in what we do. Um, so when I teach, I teach a course on ethical issues in museums and every year, especially when I talk about deaccessioning, but um, often when I talk about other issues, the students ask, so what happens when a museum doesn't follow the code of ethics? Are there any repercussions? I mean, they know that basically there's not going to be, you know, you're not going to be arrested because it's, these aren't legal issues, they're ethical issues. And Certainly, it can sometimes seem like there are no repercussions, but I think that the most immediate repercussion is damage to a museum's reputation because they're criticized, can be criticized roundly in the media. In several instances um, in the US involving deaccessioning, there have been demonstrations in front of the museums, um, and those demonstrations have, have underscored the public outrage over the sales or potential sales of museums collections. And they've also made the public's attachment to the museum's um, collections more visible. This was especially true a couple of years ago at the Berkshire Museum in Massachusetts, where demonstrations in front of the museum were shared and promoted actively on Facebook and other social media for months. And um, even after the objects were sold, so the museum was suffering, suffered a great deal um, in, because of the outcry against their, um, their work. Even more immediately, the Baltimore Museum of Art, which announced just a couple months ago that they were going to deaccession um, on several paintings, they're not, they're not just seeing reputational damage. They're also seeing um, their loot, they've lost members of their governing board and $50 million of pledged gifts. So again, there can be some very concrete, um, very concrete repercussions. In um, Great Brit Britain, a few years ago, the Northampton Museum decided to sell a statue of Sekemka, which was uh, from the fifth Egyptian fifth dynasty. The sale of the um, of the antiquity was controversial, not only in the UK, but also in Egypt. Um, which condemned the sale as incompatible with the value and role of museums worldwide. And with, they felt which the museum should spread culture rather than seek to earn money. Nonetheless, the Northampton Museum sold the statue and they were roundly criticized by the UK Museums Association. They lost their accreditation from the Museums Association and the Arts Council England, England and subsequently also um, were not eligible for other federal funding or funding that they had received from the government. So again, there were serious repercussions. Um, and in New York State, where I live, um, even now, the um, state has regulations that require the museums essentially to abide by the ICOM code of ethics, which is reflected in our national code of ethics. Um, and if we don't, we lose our, we could lose our charter, which means that we would be, um, you know, sort of has to have to cease operating if in fact we used our collections for, um, for, um, anything other than uh, caring for the collections that we currently have or buying new objects. So there are repercussions, certainly these for deaccessioning, but also for other violations of the code of ethics. And those repercussions can be severe. So we can't really take the code of ethics lightly. Um, so we need to really think about it and use it to guide our practice um, on, a, on a daily basis. So um, the ethics committee will soon be releasing uh, standards related to accessioning as well as standards related to fundraising um, or, and 
corporate and other kinds of sponsorship from museums. We hope that the executive board will um, allow us to release these in the very near future because we have other projects in the works. And um, as I noted earlier, the kinds of societal shifts that led to the changes in the code of ethics in, in um, 2000 or in the early 2000s continue to affect us today. But as you mentioned, Kaya, um, issues like the ongoing, Im ongoing impact of trans, whoops, sorry, um, trans global migration, um, the influence of social media on our lives, a heightened concern with sustainability and environmental change in the, in the face of environmental degradation, increasing income disparities. All of those things are, are concerns that we have now that are really given even greater urgency because of the global pandemic. So as a result of that, um, EFCOM has realized, and we actually realized this before this, the pandemic, but we realized that the current code of ethics doesn't take into consideration the impact of many of these issues upon museums. And we need to think about developing further guidance to address things like sustainability, requests for repatriation and restitution, social responsibility, um, and other issues like that. So we are planning to revisit the current code and to um, revise it. So in January, we're going to be reaching out to national and international committees to ask them to help us to identify things that are missing in the current code of ethics. We're also going to do a social media campaign to reach out to individual members of ICOM to seek their guidance um, in the same regard. So we'll be asking people to, again to tell us what's missing. And with this information, then we will begin the task of revising the code of ethics, um, which we hope to have finished by the um, by the triennial meeting in Prague in 2022. So if the new code is successful, it will help frame how those of us who work in and with museums think about the issues that we face day to day and help us consider how to weigh competing values when we face an ethical dilemma. As museum professionals, I believe that our work is really a calling. It's a passion and we are passionate about the values that our museums represent and that are realized through our various museums missions. Our code of ethics should be a document that highlights our core values and helps us think through those values as they manifest themselves in our daily work. Ultimately, the ethics, ethics committee hopes that the ICOM code of ethics will continue to guide the profession into the future while helping us preserve the trust that the public places in all that we do. So we hope that it has a continuing role in all of our lives and um, will, be, will be guidance for us well into the future. So, thank you. And I see that there are some questions <laughs> to answer. Um, the first one that, I is, um, that I'm going to address is really the stages of the revision process. So um, we are, as I mentioned, we will be reaching out through the national, and because the ICOM membership is so large, reaching out to the membership as a whole is much more practical through the international and national committees. So actually our reaching out to the committees has two aspects to it. One, we know that a number of the national committees and some of the international committees have developed elaborations on the code of ethics. And we want to be able to share those with the whole museum community as, as long as the national committees or international committees are willing to do that. So we, um, EFCOM is going to work with ICOM to develop a portal on which we can put these, um, the elaborations that have been written. And so we'll be able to share those more broadly um, and provide a resource for the field. So that's one part of the, of the survey. And certainly we will use those elaborations as we um, address the revision of the code. But the second part of the survey is really what's missing. 
what does ICOM need to address in its code of ethics that we haven't addressed so far. We're working very closely with the museum definition um, committee in doing this. Um, they will be doing a survey at the same time, at about the same time about their own issues. They're asking for keywords um, related to the related to the definition. So we will be sharing what we learn about what's missing from the code of ethics, and they will be sharing what they learn from their survey. So that um, really just like the 2004 um, effort in creating the code of ethics, the ethics committee will eventually be able to reorganize the code of ethics if it's necessary to reflect the priorities that are expressed in the new museum definition. So we hope we'll be working hand in hand with them. Do you so. think uh, when we discuss, now, now we, we opened the other topic, yes. which is of course also crucial, and this is the new museum definition. And last year, the debate about the new definition well, I mean, it was quite vivid and um, uh, chaotic. And uh, when we arrived in Kyoto, of course, it, it went on for hours and hours and people quarreled, best friends quarreled. And uh, actually at the end, no one knew at the end what would be the best definition. But we all agreed that we needed a new definition because so much things changed so rapidly. Mm -hmm. And of course, no one really realized that Three months later, we will all be stuck home and museums <laughs> closed. And actually, that maybe right now we need more a new definition than it was needed in September mm -hmm. last year in in Kyoto, because actually our work has really changed in a certain way. Um, we sometimes um, say it, uh, laughing that we closed our doors, but actually we opened all our windows, especially mm -hmm. the virtual one. So what museums are right now doing, they're trying to find new ways of how to connect with public. Mm -hmm. Even the European Union find one of this, um, this topic a priority since the Horizon 2020, which is one of the biggest scale European grant programs is now taking a launch uh, of discussing how museums should develop new digital tools. Mm -hmm. So we are moving in completely new topics. And my question is, do you think that these topics should also be part of the new code of ethics, the digital life of the museums? I think it should. Um, I mean, a code of ethics is um, provides a fairly high, high level in the sense of a general level of um, statement of principles or values. Um, and I think definitely the, the whole digital world will come into the code of ethics. It's important because, um, I mean, even on a very basic level, institutions and museums need to have um, a policy about how to use social media and how to how to properly, you know, ref how who ha who should be using social media on behalf of the museum, for example. So there are lots of very uh, lots of smaller issues that museums need to think about, and I think the um, the code of ethics can provide some very basic um, guidance or direction in in ways of thinking about it. I mean, it's intimidating though because the whole, as we know too well, the digital world also is changing very fast, so it's hard to keep up. Um, but I think we will, that will also be included definitely. Okay, thanks. We have two questions, much more connected also to the work of the national committees and mm -hmm. of. Uh, code of ethics um, in its own. So one is how autonomous the ethic commission is, not just the biggest one, but also the national ethical committees mm -hmm. in relation to membership. And do we need or not a consent for the pronouncement of the ethic committees? If they have something uh, to say, are they autonomous or they should first um, discuss it with its members? I think this this varies is going to vary a lot from country to country. Certainly, for the ICOM Ethics Committee, um, we are basically. I mean, we do help members when members have a request for um, for help with a, a an ethical issue, but our primary role is to act through the secretariat. So when we're presented with um, an ethical dilemma, we consider it 
internally within the committee and come up with a consensus response, which we then present to the secretariat. So we act, we, I guess we act in both ways. Um, we respond to specific requests for, from membership and follow issues that they um, bring to our attention. And in the more, in the significant issues that ICOM is, is asked to resolve, we confer and give our decisions to ICOM. So um, we work that, I mean, the ethics committee I think is interesting in that it's a standing committee, it's appointed by the president um, and the executive board and is usually made up of, of experts in the field in the sense that it's made up of people who are um, have some experience thinking about um, thinking about ethical issues in museums. So it's a um, it's a committee that works pretty independently, um, but it also ultimately is responsive to the membership and to the secretariat. I don't know whether that really answers the question. I can't really speak for national committees um, as a whole because they vary so much from place to place. Yeah, of course. Uh, it's much more connected now um, also to the other questions that was posed by uh, Ralf Ceplak. He's the president of, uh, president of ICMA. Right. Also. So Ra 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 Ralf is asking, ICOM is an NGO. So is the code of ethics an obligation for its members, but not for all the museums and museums employees? Many governments rely on the ICOM code of ethics, but sometimes they don't follow it. What can we do? Well, I think it, it's the ICOM code of ethics is, is supposed to be for all, all ICOM members, all ICOM member museums, all ICOM member museum staff. So it's supposed to be more generally applicable to everybody in the field. Um, it's, it's guidance and um, very specific decisions about ethics in, in specific cases need to be made according to the facts, the, the very specific facts of a case. So sometimes it's hard to see when, um, or hard, hard to understand why a decision is being made in a certain way. Something might appear not to abide by the code, but may in fact be guided by the code. But I think open sort of, um, you know, openly going against the code of ethics is problematic. And in those cases, um, national committees can intercede and um, make statements about the appropriate, you know, the appropriate way of doing things essentially as guided by the code of ethics. I think it's important to do that, whether it's a national committee or ICOM more generally. Um, because it helps the public understand um, why, you know, what the appropriate way of conducting museum business. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's time also for other questions and answers from our side. So please, if you have any questions, just write them down. You have a section called questions and answers and still you have the chat. So, um, we are here discussing the code of ethics and um, all the work within the code of ethics and professionalism in the museums. Um, now it's the time for, for questions. <laughs> right. Do you know in how many languages it is translated? I think it's 38 something like that, 34 or 38, it's been tra translated into lots of different languages, which of course poses <laughs> another problem. If it's revised, it's going to require a lot of uh, revision across many different languages. So um, it'll be, and uh, keep people busy for a while in catching up. Yep. But, um, what do you think are right now the most important concerns that museums around the globe have because of of the COVID and um, well, you know, certainly, you know, in the US um, 
I think this is true around the globe. I mean, the full financial situation of museums is really in severe. Um, we have estimated that as many as one third of all the museums in the US will not exist anymore in the future. Um, and I don't, that's a pretty large number um, and very frightening to think about, but, um, but museums are having very severe problems. And in some ways, I think this is, provides an opportunity for museums to rethink how they're working and um, to rethink how they're working financially and see, um, I mean, one of the things that happens very often in our museums is that we are encouraged to grow, to, to do more, to build more, to become more visible. Um, and, but we're never, and, and we can easily get support for that. But what we can't get support for is to pay the operating costs, costs on a daily basis. And um, because our museums are not supported by the government, um, we have to raise, we have to raise that operating money from someplace. Um, so many of our museums have, um, you know, sort of need to rethink their the model on the, which they operate and maybe um, bigger isn't better. Um, maybe, you know, using the internet is a way to reach a much larger audience than building a new building. So it's a, um, and I think that this kind of re-examination of what we do um, is something that the pandemic is, is encouraging us in a way to do, to, to rethink what's, what is really important. Um, so I think financially the, the pandemic is, is sort of um, making the financial issues that we have come to the fore. Um, but it's also making a lot of other issues about inequality um, and who come, who uses our museums, what are our museums for, come out much more. And um, we are, I think that we need to really examine those issues and how we're going to address them. Um, because one of the things that happens when you have financial issues is that you can easily just pull in and, um, you know, not re not continue to reach out to try to develop a broader public, but just rely on, on uh, who comes to your, muse your museum anyway. And that would, I think, be a real mistake. And probably the other thing is also the opening of the market of antiques, because actually we know that through the process of the ac accession, you can put very important antiques on the market. Right. And that's the other question. And of course, it's not just about, it's not just financial, it's also uh, ethical. Uh, we have two questions. One is okay. from uh, Tanya Ruzenberger. And she's asking, uh, she's the ex-president of ICOM Slovenia. And what, are, what is the other urgent areas that our committee, the ETCON committee is um, interested in and which topics are addressed? By, by the committee? Mm -hmm. um, well, in, we are um, also likely to address restitution and repatriation. I think that's one of the issues that has, has continued to come up, um, the discussions about decolonization of museums um, and could have a um, very wide ranging um, impact on the the way that we do all of our work um and the kinds of re relationships that we have with the communities whose collections we take care of so i think that's another area um we're hoping to have some standards for restitution um, and repatriation for university museums and um within the next year or so there's a project ongoing about that and um so i hope that we'll be able to have some standards there and also um more general standards about repatriation and restitution um, okay um and there is a question uh from Patrick Papps. she's asking if there are more examples from the national committees who have reacted strongly when a member institution did not respect the code, then the one of mentioned from the UK. So how often do the national committees react and how strongly? 
are they any frontline watchers and what the when the code is respected in the countries? I think this is a very important question. It is, it is. Um, and um, I mean, my, my experience obviously is very centered in the United States. So I apologize for that because I don't have a broad understanding of, of other national committees. And unfortunately, or for, I don't know, I, uh, my colleagues will probably hate me for saying this, but in the United States, it is the pro large pro national professional organizations rather than the national committee that have responded um, in instances where there have been problems. Um, again, deaccessioning comes to mind because that's usually the most, you know, gets the most attention in the media, but um, our, the Association of Art Museum Directors has cens censored some of its um, members when they have deaccessioned and used the funds for operating costs. What that means for them is that um, the museum, the offending museum loses its membership in the AAMD and also loses its ability to um, borrow objects from other art museums in the US or and they're not allowed to loan objects to other art museums in the US for a period of time. And since art museums rely very heavily on borrowing objects from other places in order to create the kinds of exhibitions that they do, this is a, uh, a severe penalty for them to um, pay. But, but AMD has been very strict in, um, in enforcing their code of ethics, which is actually even stricter than the ICOM code. Their, their code of ethics only allows for museums to use funds from deaccessioning for acquisitions. So um, although because of the pandemic, there's a two year um, change in that and they, they um, art museums can use the code for care of collections now for the period of time that the pandemic is affecting. So they're now in concert uh, with the ICOM code. So both the um, Association of Art Museum Directors and the American Alliance of Museums speak out when there are serious um, breaches of the code of ethics and um, they make statements. Um, so our, our national organizations um, take, take on that role. Um, our national committee is relatively new and um, it's, I mean, it's, it's been reorganized in, in over the past 10 years and it has not taken that role as, as strongly as the associations have done. Although it has, it does speak out um, it, again in, collaboration with the American Alliance of Museums in specific cases that involve international issues. So, so the, okay, I think that we are already um, waiting for the last questions. If there are any questions, now it's the time. Uh, and if not, we will finish here because uh, we said that it's going to be a one hour webinar and um, one hour finished very quickly. <laughs> um, so, so I have a question oh. actually, for if someone wants to dare to answer this, um, do you think there should be more serious repercussions for someone violating the code of ethics? I mean, should we, technically um, one could lose one's membership in ICOM um, that has happened, I'm told, but not necessarily for breaches of the code of ethics, um, but for other kinds of situations that have been so problematic. The institution, uh, or the individual or the individual. Yeah. I mean, yeah, either one. I mean, it's something to think about. I'm not sure that it would be wildly popular, but, um, yeah. but, or what kind of impact it would have, but it's something, um, it's, it's something that might add um, a little bit more seriousness to breaches of codes as in, um, you know, the, the chair of ICMI asked. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it, I think it has really a lot to do with what do you 
think or what do you expect when you enter in the icon family mm -hmm. it has to do a lot with the, the the consciousness of being a part of icon if you want to be a part of icon it's completely different for a museum institution itself uh, as it is for the individual members but many individuals members have um, have uh, connected with other members all around the globe. So basically, I think that if you established yourself around the globe, working with the people from several different museums on the same topics, you are aware of the code and you respect mm -hmm. the code. If you are working only in your own environment or you don't really think that the code of ethics is something that has to do a lot with you and with your own work, then of course, there is a problem. So mm -hmm. my idea is that actually we have to educate. Yeah. The education, 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 and then the awareness. Mm -hmm. Being able to discuss the problems that you have within your own environment, especially mm -hmm. in your own museum, in your own country, and in your in within the museums that are discussing the same topics as your own museum is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's very important. I mean, one of the things that I've noticed as I've gotten more involved in ethical um, in, in topics related to ethics is that we don't talk about ethics enough. Um, we talk about it uh, when we have a problem and when we have to solve the problem or when the, you know, somebody from the local newspaper calls us um, and challenges us on something that we're doing. But we don't do that um regularly and i think it helps to have to be able to have conversations about ethical issues and to understand why they're there um so that once you're faced with a problem you have a little bit more information and comfort with thinking through the values that are at stake and um thinking through how to make the decision so yeah um i think and maybe it's important I, yeah and i mean I can also finish with what, what I started with. It's about uh, choices, mm -hmm. choosing what you think is right for for your for yourself as a museum professional, and what is right to be done by your own museum or your mm -hmm. own environment. Um, right. And it has to do with choosing, not to be a bystander. Mm -hmm. And right now, I think we are in the period where we have to choose where we are not mm -hmm. discussing equality right it's, it's not yeah. neutral right exactly. problems in our society it's not neutral yeah. and when we stand when we read the code it's also important so um, mm -hmm. but yeah this is me as an individual person working <laughs> in a museum <laughs> um <laughs> right but it but it's true it's really it's an important document it's a guiding document and it's a changing document but it's a really important document to help us in in um in what we do i mean when i first started um thinking about ethics i was i had just been a director of a museum for a number of years and um i really was i, I was surprised at thinking back over the time that I had been leading a museum, how many ethical decisions I had made. I mean, it was almost on a daily basis that something would come up. Um, it's really the, I think code of ethics is really a foundation of what we do. Um, and it's, it's really important. Yeah. What we do and who so, we are. Right, exactly. And we will finish with this uh, sentences. Thank you so much, Sally for being with us. Uh, thank you everyone for staying with us for this hour and um, take right. your quote, read it again, and we can discuss it again right. and again and again. Thank you. And so respond, much. respond to our questions in January to our social media campaign. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Great. Bye. Thank you. Great. Bye bye.